Welcome to the sixth installment of our Other Space Audio Logs. Uh, I'm Wes Platt, uh, the lead writer and developer of Other Space at jointhesaga.com. And uh, thanks again for listening. Uh, with each of these installments, uh, I do a reenactment of stories that have taken place uh, on the mush, uh, either in the original classic uh, version, which is the real time uh, pen mush platform, which uh, ran from roughly 1998 to this year, uh, and still is actually up, but not as active uh, at jointhesaga.com 1790 on Telnet. Um, we're now on Slack uh, for the most part, and the best way to join up uh, is to get on via Slack Pass, and that's at https colon slash slash slackpass.io slash join the saga. And that automatically joins you up and makes you part of this evolving epic, which it is hard for me to believe this, but coming up on June 28th, we're celebrating the 19th year of other space. Um, it is astonishing. Uh, hum- yeah, I have an incredibly humbling uh, you know, thought that this has taken up uh, so much of my creative energy and, uh, and love and, and joy over time. Uh, to put this uh, together and share it with so many people from around the world. Uh, A lot of them have come and gone, um, but one of the things I really enjoy about doing these audio logs, especially when I do this kind of archaeological experiment of uh, going back and doing older logs, uh, is that I get to uh, kind of uh, revisit uh, these experiences, which were so much fun when they happened. Um, So uh, before I get to the uh, story of the day, which is called interlude with a vampire. Uh, I want to go ahead and say thanks uh, to our Patreon uh, executive level sponsors, our Raconteur sponsors. That's El Windus and Newt. Um, They are huge supporters for us, contributing uh, $12 a month. Uh, I really appreciate the support. Uh, It helps cover our server costs. It helps cover the uh, the costs of uh, marketing and the costs of, you know, for example, every month I'm uh, identifying a player of the month. Uh, so far, Nick Palazzo has been killing it uh, by sharing on social media and really getting the word out about other space on his channels. So I really uh, appreciate their contributions and his contributions to the, uh, uh, the community aspect of the game. Um, but the more the merrier. We started something uh, this past month with the Flash Fiction uh, Club, which is basically anybody who contributes at least a dollar a month to our Patreon at patreon.com slash join the saga. Uh, I'll write a short Flash Fiction piece, like 100 words or less, every month that you contribute. Uh, that'll be dedicated to you. Uh, might be other space, might be something else, but uh, in any event, just trying to do whatever I can uh, to show my appreciation as much as I can. So, without further ado, this is a story called Interlude with a Vampire. We originally played through this scene, oh my god, more than 17 years ago. This was January 21st of 2000. This took place uh, aboard Sanctuary during our sixth story arc. And uh, the whole th- story of what's happening here is that Jax, uh, who is the kind of the first Timonet to ever serve as Eye of the Valshahobian Mystics, has eaten a really potent chili uh, and now has some kind of strange dream that involves, well, I'm just going to have to read it and you'll see for yourself. From the familiar confines of the Fool's Pride bunk module and a deep, uneasy sleep, Jax suddenly finds himself rudely awakened in Hog Heaven, a swirling, rather nebulous region where, is anyone's guess, occasionally the odd incandescent bubble drifts up amongst the many-colored swirls and pops gently, releasing tiny little piglets with wings that merrily flit about, as well as miniature Harleys revving hell fire and brimstone, also bewinged. 
Louder rumbles herald the approach of larger Harleys, oftentimes pillioned by chunky porkers in leather, sunglasses, and sometimes flower-child clothing. Pink elephants of all sizes, winged, cherubic, and kazoo-bearing, float about in humble servant capacity for the slightest wish or whim. Dream Sequence Vampire a crow of a man with disconcerting sunken eyes of indeterminate color they always seem to gleam tall with the gaunt pale features of a scavenger he wears tunic and trousers of coarse black cloth the trousers are folded under where the right leg ends below the knee a tattoo of barbed wire encircles his left eye and loops around his shaved head trailing down his left cheek and around his neck he wears big glittery pink sunglasses and a blue feather boa. His biker boot is sprouting with rhino tusks. He's wearing a big crimson fez and a Groucho Marx plastic nose and mustache and a Karl Marx faux beard. Vampire perches atop a massive Harley Davidson motorcycle, revving the engine madly and smoking a cartoonishly huge stogie. He takes off his big pink glittery sunglasses long enough to wink suggestively at Jack's, then slips them back on again. Evening, sunshine, he smooches at Jack's. Jack's blinks once, then again he sits up. Vampire pats the generous seat space behind him on the motorcycle seat. Hop on, sweet cheeks, we're going to town. Jack's sighs softly. Anything to get me riding your hog, eh, corpse? He moves toward the motorcycle. Vampire wiggles his hairless brows. Oh, baby! He makes an oinking noise. He smirks cheesily. Come on, board up the butt, boy. We ain't got all night. Jax straddles the motorcycle. Onward, he directs. Vampire shakes his head. Nope, not till you put those spindly arms of yours around my waist. Again, the oinking. He revs the motorcycle engine, which growls throatily. Jack says, Once more, I am a victim of circumstance. He places his arms around Vampire's waist. There. Fantasy made reality. A tiny Harley flaps its wings as its engines roars to life and propels itself past Vampire and Jack's. Vampire shivers. Damn. He touches the accelerator, and the motorcycle begins to spin like a centrifuge gone mad. Vampire begins to contort into strange, tattooed pretzel shapes as the motorcycle whirls about. Must have hit wrong button! Jax, in the midst of this, inquires, Is that a pink elephant? Vampire struggles to reach with a sort of pseudopod that might once have been a hand, for a globule of spinning motorcycle that might be a button of some kind. Or are you just glad to see me? Another tiny Harley pulls up alongside Vampire and Jax, its miniature rider snarling at the two beside him. Hey, you hit the wrong button! He laughs rudely and pulls away from the two. The giant hog slows from its freakish centrifugal spin and comes to rest facing toward a massive guppy that has appeared out of nowhere, mouth opening and closing, largely revealing a tunnel. A large, hefty pink elephant flaps its massive way over to Jackson Vampire. My dears, is there anything, anything at all I can help you with, it burbles, solemnly flapping large drafts of chocolate-scented air onto the pair. Jax mutters, this is the last time I eat Jordan's 13-alarm chili. Vampire readjusts his head, which is settled in a rather backward and very unnatural position, after giving Jax a quick smooch. Jax's mouth does its best attempt to invert itself in reply to the smooch. Vampire, it seems, isn't his type. Vampire giggles oinkingly, revs the engine, and the motorcycle oink-oinks its way into the mouth of the guppy. No, it doesn't sound as biblically impressive as the belly of the whale, but you can just cope. A tiny Harley revs its impressive large way beside Vampire, the rider smirking and zooms through with a throaty roar. A trio of winged pink elephants in tutus flies past, performing a graceful aerial ballet. Jax mumbles something that sounds suspiciously like Swan Lake, then yells over the growl oink of the hog to Vampire. What's in the fish? Vampire waggles an impossibly long Salvador Dolly warped finger. 
The future! A single elephant floats droopily along. I could have been a contender. He had to pick that other kid. Darn! A large gray elephant holding a feather in its trunk and wearing clown hat that hits a tiny mouse in a ringleader's uniform flies by. Oh, wait, wrong set of elephants. A large hog in a witch's outfit flies past on a broomstick, cackling, I'll get you, my pretty, and your little hog, too. Jax's eyes bug out a bit. My future is pink elephants and motorcycles? Two large slugs cut across Vampire and Jax's line of travel, one on the banana seat of a green Harley, the other in the sidecar. Hey, look at the mystic. Let's all get a picture. Picture! They both scream, pictures, pictures, pictures! A strobe effect, blindingly so, so an automatic camera goes off, and the pair of slimy beings wave. Thank you, mystic. We got pictures. And then they're gone again. Vampire's hyperextended finger tickles the throat of the guppy, which speaks echoingly. Oh, my dear goodness, I've got a hog in my throat. And it begins to hack and wheeze, and then spurts the Harley with Jackson Vampire out of its mouth on a big wave of yellow simu sputum, trademark, and the motorcycle comes to rest near Yamanels of the future. Jax says with a look of looks that borders on screaming terror, Oh no. Vampire bellows in true John Hausman-esque fashion. See what you have wrought, Arandius Jax, and weep! The hardwood panels all bear signs of crayon-based destruction at two feet and below. Besides that, the office of the Emperor President is resplendent in its finery. The rich desk is adorned with a bedraggled Yamanels. Shuffling through a Rolodex as a little runt ruffles through his desk, children are scattered throughout the room, an itinerant teal chasing after. Several of the vermin sit slack-jawed as a blue sweater-clad thug portrays the hourly Mr. Fagan's neighborhood. Jax says, surely not I. Vampire chomps on his stogie and waggles his hairless brows. Of course it was you. And don't call me Shirley. Waka waka oink oink. Future Yama. The man before you stands a little over six feet tall with a strong posture. His high cheekbones and Roman nose contradicting with a pale... Almost Eurasian complexion are the most prominent features on his sleek face. His hair is sharp and crisp wisps protruding spikily from his forehead. A faint line can be seen running about his neck, nothing more. His other startling feature are two furry Demarian arms that seem to have replaced his arms of birth. A checkerboard of purple and gold adorns his right arm, while the other is striped in green and turquoise. Yama is draped in the formal garbs of the President Emperor of the Imperial Consortium. They hang loosely over his frame, massive sleeves opening like gaping maws. The vermilion and orange colors clash and war over terrain, arcing in lengths over the fabric. He nearly seems to trip over the expansive hem, the tail end dragging along the carpet. The hood is slung back loosely behind his head. Future Teal this ungsteery woman is quite matronly, round-cheeked, slightly plump, and very pregnant. She's about five foot five. Her jet black hair is long and braided into a ponytail that falls down to her ankles, and her blue eyes sparkle with joy. She waddles about with a sweet, cheery disposition and a kind word for everyone she meets. Right now, her gravid form is clad in a blue and white checked gingham dress with a white lace apron tied over it. Simple black flats are on her feet. One of the little brats shrills, Mommy! Muffin took my pickle! And throws crayons bad-temperedly at Yama, screaming, Bad, Daddy! Bad! Teal waddles as fast as she can after various rugrats. Gervais, I've told you time and time again, Daddy needs to work. Stay out of that. Muffin, away from the trophies. Vivian, Ashley, stop fighting. Horatio, stop placing bets on the fight. Yama swings ineffectually at one of the runts crawling on the desk. Linden, no, that button causes the destruction of the Senate! A hesitant look crosses his face as he shoves the child edgeward. Jack says, how could this possibly be my fault? Though their impending horror of a reproduction has much plagued me. This? This is my fault? Vampire makes a smoochy face at Jack's, then goes back to watching the sideshow. 
Teal wistfully looks at her loving mate, her long hair swinging behind her. Maybe I should take them home, Snookums? Yama hefts the child, sprinting towards Teal. He shoves Linden into her arms, trying to wipe away applesauce stains from the robe's collar. An errant peck lack lands on Teal's nose as he explains, Heaven forbid, my little Lejeune, it's time they learn the functions of government. Besides, you know what the Cretonians are charging for maid service these days? Another little bratling promptly clambers up onto the table and scatters a massive load of papers all over. Kitty, kitty, she shrieks and burrows into one of the drawers, causing an avalanche of chips, discs, and all manner of implements. Jack says, damn it all, why'd he have to be so fertile? Vampire smirks, and live. Teal whines, Yama, Junior, you get out of that desk this instant. Yama hear, Yama's ears beep rapidly. Another Null invasion? Bugger all. Yama Millhouse Nels the second. You get out of the CBC briefings this instant. Yama catches a wandering Ashley, wiping off sauce from his round, pallid cheeks with his cuff. Yama Millhouse Nels the second, who just happens to be female, flails a chocolate-covered fist at another pudge with the words Dilly scrolled over a horrific bright purple t-shirt. But I want Kitty! She screams. Vampire sighs happily. Warms the cockles, don't it, Jaxie boy? Teal is about to follow when she gets an odd look on her face. Oh, sugar yams, the triplets. She puts a hand on her belly. I'm going into labor. Jack says, yes, a rush of bile will do that. Vampire oopses. You don't want to watch the miracle of more childbirth, do you, Jacksonator? Yama gasps. Maquambe, Ignatius, and Cromwell, summon the midwives. Jack says, I think that might be more than my psyche could bear. Vampire revs the engine, pops a wheelie, and sends the Harley zooming forth. It plunges through the wall of the office, which ripples like water and splashes like it, too. A fish flaps in Jax's teeth as they emerge somewhere new, the Remy LeBeau and Sister Esther of the future. Yama braces Teal's legs as the scene hopefully dissolves around them. Vampire screeches to a dripping halt. A fish falls from the vampire's shoulder and flops lazily on the ground before disappearing with a pift and a cloud of smoke shaped like a mushroom cloud. A scene of absolute and total chaos meets the eye. This appears to be a massively large room totally dedicated to complex physics equations and tons and tons and tons of childish scrawls all over the walls. A rake-thin woman with silvery hair that now reaches almost to her ankles dressed in a Madonna-like outfit and large clunky black leather boots is scribbling madly away at a paper-covered table. Remy, she calls desperately, where's Torlinus again? He's eaten my last equation. Future LeBeau. Before you stands a humanoid male. He appears to be in his mid-thirties. He stands just over two meters and looks to weigh around 230 pounds. His hair is a red-brown mix with a bit of gray creeping in over his ears and in small streaks in other places. His eyes are completely black with nothing more than a red spot in the middle where the pupil would be. There are small lines at the edges of his eyes and at the corners of his mouth. He wears a gray business suit with a badge hanging out of the breast pocket that reads, Sanctuary Unified States Diplomat. Jack settles into a sort of resigned slump behind Vampire on the bike. What a smashing diplomat he makes, he says with a sigh. The fish in Jack's mouth flops out into his lap as he speaks. LeBeau scans the large crowd of red-haired children, which all have silver streaks. I don't even remember which one Torlanus is, hon. After the first dozen, they all start to look alike. One of us is named Torlanus? asks a small girl innocently, looking around at her siblings in confusion. Jax plucks up the fist, gesturing to the children. How's this possible? Shahobians and Lunites cannot breed. A fish walks past with a sign reading, no, no more hooks, down with fishermen. One little redhead pipes up. Dad won't ease twirling his papa, he points to a twin. LeBeau shrugs as he looks down at her. That's what your mommy thinks, you're Marie, right? Jax frowns at the fish in his hand as though noticing for the first time what he's gesturing with. He lobs it at the sign of the protesting fish. Vampire glances back toward Jax, one eye filling a giant sunglass lens and spiraling hypnotically. Forget what you know. LeBeau yells out above all the jabbering and whining. Okay, whichever one of you ass Torlinus, will you cough up your mom's work? 
You know how upset she gets when she misplaces a decimal point. The fish with the sign gets stuck with the, struck with the other fish and both disappear in a mushroom cloud. A pink elephant clad in purple, green, and yellow does loop the loops. La le bon temps rouler, oui? Suddenly a ruckus breaks out as about twelve little mysticlets charge up the stairs. It's my wind, declares a ferocious-looking little one about eight years of age. Nuh-uh, that is not, declares another as the pack hassle and fight all their way to the study. A sad clown blumbers past, pausing to pout at Jack's. Another fish appears with a sign reading, Fish Killer. It begins prancing back and forth near Jack's and Vampire. Vampire speaks in a booming voice. We're going to need a bigger bike. Jax pouts in reply to the clown, saying, Je trouvé mon coeur. And as if by magic, Vavoom! Rumble! The Harley doubles in size. Jax makes a little strangled noise as his legs are abruptly jerked further apart. LeBeau is about to call out to Esther as he has salvaged what he could of her equation from the child's mouth when the gang come roaring in and he sighs, Pierre, Jacques, Franco, Rondo, and whoever the rest of you are, how many times have I told you about reading each other's minds to see all your games? Another clown walks past holding a sign, still waiting for Godot. Yet another clown walks, his feet on the ceiling, his head at about Jack's level. He carries a sign that reads, We'll work for seltzer water. A cow walks by on two feet, udders hanging lazily above the ground. It, too, holds a sign. Milk. Do you really need it? A clown car arrives and runs down the clowns. A crazed ringmaster leans out, screaming bloody murder. Karl Marx, nude-chinned and rather miffed-looking, stomps onto the scene, clambers up the massive motorcycle, and tugs at Vampire's smoke-gray beard, crying, Das is mine! Das is mine! Vampire kicks the communist propagandist upside the head with a rhino horn-adorned boot, sending Marx sprawling among the fishes. Did not fada bomimi is seedin, declares one of the broodlings. But Pierre de have cat and says another broodling before he nods quickly in response to the one who has just spoken. Why, he said. A turban-clad guppy flushes by, grabbing the peaked Carl down into his spiral. Bourgeoisie is all he burbles before being sucked down the wind of bubbles. A lazy big Budweiser toad drifts down by the clown who's waiting for Godot. Erp, it states eloquently, then, Tray bong, tray 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 bong. Vampire glances back toward Jax, his beard askew. No, really, his beard has turned into Reuben Askew. The beard, Askew, asks you, well, you being Jax, seen enough? Lebeau shakes his head and plops down on the floor. Don't you have to go meditate or read or some prophecy about how and where Fagin is with the rest of these babysitters? Esther rises in a cloud of fishnet and pointy bra and gathers up children in each hand. Twenty-four of these, Remy, and you can't even remember their names, she scolds with a sigh. Jax nods. I think so. You know, you've overturned the communist model in one fell swoop. He gestures to the fallen marks. Vampire hums. I never thought he was all that pretty. With that, he revs the Harley and speeds forth into hog heaven once more. LeBeau looks up at Esther. Hey, I was begging you to stop at twelve. You just want to keep going. A chameleon pulls out a big friggin' cannon and assassinates the Budweiser frog. At last, the job is mine! Wiki wiki! snicks the weasel. Jack says it's more about the clothes than the man. Vampire sighs wistfully. Ain't that the ever loving truth? Vampire is now tooling down a long, lonely stretch of desert road in hog heaven. But, of course, no stretch of road in hog heaven is really that lonely. Okay, so the roads here do buy Victoria's Secret catalogs, but they aren't lonely in the other senses. A motorcycle cop rides up alongside Jackson Vampire and holds up a picture to them, asking, Have you seen this boy? His name is John Connor. Vampire glances down at the cop and says, No, but if you hum a few bars, I can... Wait, that doesn't work. The young steery rowboat team strokes up beside Vampire and Jax. Nice wheels, they say, before pulling away, leaving the muscle bike in their wake. Stroke! 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 Arnold Schwarzenegger follows along behind the cop on a Harley with a shotgun. It is not a tumor. Vampire calls over his shoulder. 
Okay, Jack's old man, now you've really got to see this. You're going to love it. Dig it, sugar! He snaps his fingers and the motorcycle comes to rest in a virtual trailer park. A sudden, lazy whirling of a parasol drifts closer and closer, a large penguin upon which rides a neon green nene churs. Why, my honey child, you gotten your knickers in a twist. The cop looks back at Arnold. I'll be back. Wait, that's your line. He then revs up with a squeal of tires and heads off. Arnold rides after him, yelling, Come with me if you want to die! Jax glances around the trailer park. Why are we here? he inquires. Tumbleweeds go drifting past. Just wait, mystic boy, you'll see. One of the tumbleweeds comes back. A spotlight shines on it. I just rolled in from Albuquerque, and boy are my thistles tired! It looks like, no, it is Space Mountain at Disney World. All at once, a sudden loud... Kabloom! shakes the entire trailer park, sending several large tutu rabbits fleeing. Ugh, knew I'd be late for that date if I stayed here, quips one with large pink ears. The tumbleweed rolls out of harm's way, calling out, I'll be in town about five more minutes, then I'm off to Tucson. Tip your waitress. Good night! And away it goes. A cop car pulls up, and a camera crew and SWAT team jump out and raid one of the more run-down trailers. After a few minutes, a man holding a beer and not wearing a shirt is pulled out and placed in the car. Strange thing, his face was pixelated. As if this wasn't enough, several mystics start running down the mountainside. Young mystics, several of them have red hair, and one of the red-haired ones is holding a large keg. Bad reggae music plays in the background as the man is carted away. A mullet-bearing cheerleader, bedecked in purple and black, snickers at the incoming mystics. Brad hasn't been the same since he quit the DQ for his vision quest. Next on Fox, cops in other space. Jack says, the effect of Terran culture on the mystics. Of course. Oh, this must be stopped. I cannot allow this to come to pass. Zoom in on a pair of Zengali hooligans breaking open a shop window on Sanctuary and stealing a toaster oven. One of the non-redheads says to the keg-bearing one, Boudreaux LeBeau, we are in trouble now! A couple of the residents look at their broken watches and rush to a cellar just in time to avoid the weekly tornado that rushes through and destroys most of the trailer park. Cut to a pair of donut-munching Damarian coppers in bobby hats carrying nightsticks, humming bad boys, bad boys when they hear the alarm sound. They act surprised and nearly drop their crullers. Tracking shot as the Damarian cops chase after the Zengali hooligans and the hot toaster oven. No, really, it's hot, glowing red, cooking something even as we speak. Smells like bran muffins. Hey, you scale heads, calls one of the fat cats. Hold it right there. Don't make me throw my stick at you. Jax's eyes narrow. Hold on a minute. Trailer Park, LeBeau. Where's Rondo LeBeau? Vampire blinks lazily, his eyes fixed on the hollow vision display of cops' other space. Close-up of one Damarian cop making the ultimate sacrifice. He realizes that the only way to stop the hooligans is to pull the pin on his explosive cruller and toss it. A single tear tracks down his furry cheek. Suddenly, a petite, rounded figure in a cook's hat, waving a massive spatula, comes barreling out of the mountain, yelling, Boudreaux LeBeau, you hoopin' nincompoopish toop! You gone and blown up the damn kitchen again for the seventh time this week! Future Shaw. A severe, rather plump woman with bright blue hair and horn-rimmed tortoiseshell glasses dressed in the garb of a cook. In one hand, she holds a large spatula. She also is wearing a most awfully bright orange dress, dress that clashes horribly with her hair and stiletto boots. The mystics with the redhead, holding the keg, give a screech. Oh no, it's Mrs. Jax! Run! And they flee. Medium shot of the out-of-breath Demarian yanking the frosting-covered pin and then, huffing, tossing the pastry at the hooligans. It explodes, taking out the Zingali and the toaster oven. The other cop gets to the carnage, pops open the oven, and sniffs. Hey, he says. Muffins are done. Roll credits. Vampire glances up at the scene. Ah, Shaw. Jax blinks at the petite, rounded figure. Oh, my. Another of the mystics, who along with the other red-headed ones all look like part of LeBeau's brood, run through the trailer park, kicking up a dust storm. 
Dad is no gonna like this, sis. You know how upset he get when Mr. Shaw calls him to tell about how you blew up the kitchen by over spicing the food. A flighty female mystic rushes in after the orange clad woman. Oh dear, dear me, I thought I told them to stay out of the kitchen. Nishael charges after her errant brood, waving after the fleeing rascals a massively huge can of pepper. Boudreau! All at once, Vampire's Harley begins to cough and splutter. The man, along with the Harley, begins to shrink until suddenly, with a poof and a little flap of guppy wings, the apparition materializes into Rondo LeBeau. Jax, abruptly sitting on the ground, frowns up at Rondo. Somehow I know this is all your fault. The amazing Rondo, as young and boom-boom chick as ever, is bursting out of a bottle-green leather version of the full motorcycle gear, jacket, pants, boots, and a cute little hat. Aw, how you gonna say that to your ride? She snaps her fingers, and a large green Cadillac convertible appears, complete with horns on the grill. Jax rises. Pardon me, miss, I'd mistaken you for an abomination against nature. He moves toward the passenger door. An abomination of nature walks past the Cadillac and cries. Jack says soothingly, I did say I was mistaken, dear lady. Rondeau's green eyes glow. I'm about as natural as they get, Jaxie, honey. She winks and settles into the driver's seat. Suddenly, a group of twelve creatures that appear like birthday candles show up, each holding spears. Their heads are lit. The time has come, Brother Jax, for you to endure the rite of coming of age. You will come with us to the ceremonial arena. About this time, Space Mountain goes kabloom again, and a shriek of human distress from Shaw echoes over the entire place. Kip, stop playing Metallica! And then the entire mountain turns into a big lemon pie and drops into Rondo's lap. Rondo cackles like a witch. Hop on in, boys. I'll get us there in no time. Jax, just closing the Cadillac's door, lifts his brows at the candles. Why twelve? he inquires aloud. The birthday Onians file into the back seat one by one. They yell, Onward to the right! together. One pipes up, Sorry, the other thirteen couldn't make it. Bad wick day. The green demon, a.k.a. Rondo, slams on the gas as the car rumbles down the road and into the air to the sound of Zydeco music. Another agrees. I hate when that happens. Right about now, a large, purple-winged, green-eyed cat, upon which sits a 26-year-old Kip with a large bass guitar and flaming green hair, flaps lazily over the car. Rock on, baby, he yells with a thumbs up at Rondo. Go, go right! And off he sails. Jax reclines his seat slightly. Let's ride, he says. Sound good to me. One of the birthday candlesque creatures agrees. Let's drive, mama! Rondo takes the dessert off her lap and hands it over to Jax. Want some pie? She gives him a very vampire-esque leer. One of the birthday Onian's flames goes out on the top of its head as the car speeds up. It reaches up in worry, but the wick sparkles back to life, and it sighs and grins. Trick wick! The tormented Jax shakes his head. No, no, I've had enough sweetness for the evening. A big mouth appears and spits the wick out again. Dag nabbit! It took me days to get that lit. Again, the wick sparkles back to life a few seconds later. Rondeau emits a booming, oinking laugh and sends the car into a few spirals and loops, the speed growing. Beside the car suddenly appear a little wafting bunch of slugs, green, slurbly, and wrinkled. Specimen! Specimen! One of them chants, waving a tiny little stick-like arm at Jax and the birthday Onians wickedly. Ancient one! Spe... A moment later, a large guppy floats by in pink and orangitude, gobbles up the slugs, and passes through to flop on top of one of the candles. The arena appears ahead. In the center is a small pedestal. Jack squints at the pedestal in the distance. Curious, he says. One of the candles taps Rondeau on the shoulder. Call ahead! Tell the rest to prepare for the sacrifice! Jack says, Sacrifice? That mm, sounds disagreeable. Rondo is suddenly dressed like the Mad Hatter, but all in green. May we? She honks the horn three times, then yells, Prepare for the sacrifice! Jax, frowning, tries the door. The candles run for a long wooden chest. They open it and pull out a one foot by one foot by thirty foot board. All bow to the awesome board of rear ending! They place it on the ground and begin worshipping it. The green Cadillac goes into a deep spiral over the arena. 
Resplendent in bright green robes and a March Hare costume descends Balthazar, riding on a large pink porker. Brother Arandius, you have come at last, he greets with a steeple of his fingers and a slight smile. As the candles worship the board, they begin to chant. Thank you, sir, may I have another. Thank you, sir, may I have another. Thank you, sir, may I have another. The car lands and literally spits Jax out onto the sand. Jax lands with a pleasant woof. Somewhere, Neil Avocet cocks his head to one side and responds with a woof of his own. Jax sits up. Brother Balthazar, how utterly unexpected to find you here. Balthazar permits himself yet another tight smile as he lands majestically on his porker and signals for one of the birthdayonians to come up and help him dismount. Indeed, I am glad that you have not lost your mystic sense, he comments. Ah, the board. The candles all kneel. The board has been properly blessed, your highness. It is ready. Jax's brows lift anew. You're going to sacrifice the board of rear-ending? Rondeau lights, lights and smokes a big stogie, stepping out of the way. I love it when a plan comes together, she smirks. Balthazar smiles blandly as he sets into place one of his large floppy costume ears in the March Hare's hat. A small green slug dangles from the other ear, and a stogie like Rondeau's abruptly pops into the side of his mouth. For a moment, Vampire's face, like the Cheshire Cat's, winks into view to leer at Jack's. Oinky, oinky, he smirks, and disappears till there's nothing left of him but a grin. Jax's gaze slides to the board. You were a good board. I knew you very briefly. Go with my blessing. Balthazar flips back a loosely dangling paw of the March Hare costume. Bring me the board, he intones stentorianly. Brother Arandius, bend over. Jax's brows shoot up. You're off your rocker. The candles salute and bring the board to Balthazar. The sound of rubber gloves snapping into place echoes through the arena. Rondeau speaks in a rather non ronny voice. No, he's off his porker, sweetie. Now be a good boy and do what the man says. Stick up the butt. Balthazar inclines his head to ronny turned vampire and gestures to the birthdayonians. Bring Brother Arandius, he says. Brother Arandius, you have been chosen to be the recipient of wisdom, the path of which must come through this rite. Now, bend over. The candles surround Jax and point their spears at him. You must go through the rite! Jax, with great resignation, hauls himself to his feet. Closing his eyes and muttering something about corporal punishment, he bends over. Again, the sound of rubber gloves snapping into place echoes through the arena. Balthazar solemnly raises the one foot by one foot by thirty foot board. Brother Arandius, in the name of the Birthdayonians, I now bestow upon you the gift of wisdom in the form of the blessed boar of rear ending. With that, he swings it down and whacks Jax firmly on the butt. Jax flies through the air and lands in the familiar confines of the Fool's Pride bunk module, and like as not, wakes up in a very cold sweat. So that's it. That's our sixth installment of our Other Space audio logs. I hope you enjoyed it, and I look forward to the next one. Thanks again.